Good evening friends, wherever you are accessing to this video or to this, this sermon, uh, we bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our 37th uh, uh, yearly uh, Mount Murud Prayer Mountain Conference. This year's theme is preparing for eternity, uh, which is taken from uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 7. So this, this evening, I would like to say a little bit the history of how we started this, uh, uh, this, this, this year's uh, conference. In March of this year, one of, a, one of our intercessors from back home in Baklalan had prayed and the Lord spoke to her and told her about the theme of this year's uh, uh, meeting and then also the Lord told her who, who was to preach, who was to lead in, in the praise and worship. But then in June of this year, we gave the announcement that we said we are cancelling this conference for this year because of the restrictions uh, given by the government on the uh, SOPs and so on. And so um, she thought, well, maybe uh, this is not, the, not from the Lord after all, uh, because uh, it is not a possibility. But then in July, the committee decided that we are going to hold it, not physically, but virtually. And then um, we told them at back home that we are going to have it vi vi virtual in, in October. And so we asked them to pray again. And she was so excited because she said that the Lord had already told her about this meeting in, in March and, and, and the detail of it, the, uh, the Lord told her. And so the theme of this year and the Bible verses is not what the committee uh, uh, decided or we had a, a committee meeting and so we decided, well, this is the theme. No, this is given by the Holy Spirit. And I believe God is speaking something to us through this theme. I know that in this nation, we have been talking so much about revival, which is not wrong. And we all want revivals. But I think at the same time, God is reminding, reminding us to prepare for eternity. At the end of our journey through time, as a destination we can scarcely imagine, a destination called eternity, I think we need to talk about it. Now let me tell you briefly the, the, time, the, the time frame that God has set upon earth. We started with eternity. And then when, during the creation, in Genesis, God has created and started with time. Before this, it was in eternity. But then, during the creation, God said, let there be, let, there was evening and there was morning. And there, there was the first day and there was the second day until the seventh day. And so it began the days, the time began to be measured. Measured in, in evening, measured in days. And we went further. As we as humans went further and we, and we measured times in seconds, in minutes, in hours in years, in months, in, in decades, and century. Now, this is what we call time, which is apart from eternity, but time is within God's eternity as well. So everything in scripture points to eternity, and everything within, within us cries out for, for eternity. As Solomon observed in the Old Testament, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, he said, God has set eternity in the hearts of men, Yet, they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Actually, there was a survey done, there was a study done uh, by, uh, by some scholars uh, written by Don Richardson. They have made some study with more than 100 different cultures throughout the world. And every culture without exception believe in eternity. But it is so strange today that some people deny eternity. Friends, it just doesn't matter what we believe. Whether you believe eternity exists or eternity does not exist, it does not matter 
but the word of God stands. Eternity is there and we are going to live in eternity. God designed us to live for eternity. His work with us is not finished in this life yet. How we spend our time determines where we spend eternity. We live our lives one moment at a time and our time is running out. Now there's so much to talk about eternity, but we have a limited time this evening. And so let us focus on the verse that was given to us from Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, which reads, Whoever overcomes will receive all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. And there are other seven verses in the Bible which also speaks about overcoming. And I think this evening we'll talk, we'll, we'll refer, we'll talk specifically about those who overcome. Let me read some of the verses uh, that's found in Revelation. Revelation alone has about eight verses which refer to those who overcome. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, Jesus himself said to the church in Ephesus, he said, to him that overcomes, to him will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And then in Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, Jesus spoke to the church in Smyrna, and he said, he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus spoke to the church in Pergamum, he said, to him that overcome, to him will I give the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and upon the stone a new name written, which no one knows but he that receives it. And then in Revelation 2.26 says, Jesus spoke to the church in Theatira, and he said, He that overcomes, and he that keeps my works until the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. And then in, Re in Revelation chapter three, 3, verse 5, Jesus said to the church in Sardis, He that overcomes shall thus be arrayed in white garments, and I will in no wise blot his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And then in Re Revelation chapter 3, verse 12 says, uh, Jesus said to the church in F Philadelphia, he said, He that overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out thence no more, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and mine own new name. And then in Revelation chapter 3 verse 11, Jesus said to the church in Laodicea, He that overcomes, I will give to him to sit down with me in my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, if we, if we briefly look at the map you know, of, of these churches uh, somewhere in Asia Minor, which is called Turkey today, this is very interesting uh, a church, very interesting story, or very interesting issue that we look into this. Firstly, Jesus referred to the church in Pargamos. The church in Pargamos is said it is the seat of Satan. Whether this one is literal or metaphorical or symbolic, scholars said it is literal because in Pargamos, in the city of Pargamos, there was this temple dedicated to the devil, to Satan. And then from this temple, there were burnings, there were uh, the, the offerings. And you know, the, the smoke from this, from this temple rose up into heavens, into the sky, day and night. And it was said to be, it to be the, the, the seat of Satan. You know, Satan is not omnipotent like God is omnipotent omnipotent, omnipresent. He is not omnipresent. He can only be present in one place at one point of time. But during this time of writing, the writer, the uh, scholar said that his, his place of dwelling on earth at that point of time was in Pergamos. 
Why was it so? Because Pergamos was the city or the town that connected Europe to Asia and uh, Europe to, to Africa. And this was, although a small town, but very, very strategic. And the devil knows, and, and Satan knows, this, this place was so strategic that he made his seat or he made his dwelling there. And then two churches, which is quite distant from that place, they had, a different, they had different issues, they had different challenges. These two churches, it is said that um, there was idolatry and there was immorality in these two churches. Their problem is similar with idolatry and immorality. Now, when you look at this, there seems to have the problem is from within the church itself. There are two other churches with, which is quite a distant from, from Pergamos, and these two churches also have similar problems. Their problem was not from within the church, but it was from outside the church. They were facing, um, they were, they, they were facing some uh, enemy from the outside. And it was uh, in, in the Bible, it says the, the synagogue of Satan. And these two churches, they faced the, the same problem. They faced um, uh, difficulties or uh, attack from the outside, both of the two, two churches. Now, there were two churches which were very far from Pergamos. And these two churches, Ephesus and Laodicea, and they had this the, the quite similar problem. The problem with Ephesus is that they have left their first love. And then for Laodicea, I said they were lukewarm. You know, for churches that are lukewarm or has, or has left their first love, Satan is not really very bothered. So he doesn't give them oppression. He doesn't give them enemies from outside to attack them. He doesn't give them uh, a problem from within the church. But he just left them because they are a church which is lukewarm, which has lost their first love. Now, what do we learn from here? What we learn is that every church have their own problems. Every church have their particular and different problems that are facing. But nonetheless, Jesus is telling the people, challenging the believers in there. He said, whoever overcomes. Now, even, even the churches face different obstacles in their, in their lives, in, in their faith. They are told to overcome. And overcoming and reward are two of the things that is a lot mentioned so many times in the Bible. Now, because, because you overcome, there will be reward. Now, just as we read just now, it's, it's different type of uh, obstacle that you face, challenges that you face, you will get a different reward. Now, this is a message for us directly during this conference that we are told to overcome. Whatever the circumstances that you are in today, we are told to overcome because God desires people who overcome. Now, we are supposed to overcome so that we, we can influence the world. It is said that, one, one, one person said that um, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. This is speaking about the early church. The early church which has so great influence, it is said that they have overturned. Uh, they have turned the world upside down. Why is that so? Number one, this is one of the things missing in the modern church. In the church that we're facing today, in the church that doesn't overcome anymore. This church, it is said that the church some, some people say the church has stopped living a life of sacrifice. Now, when we look at the New Testament, when we look at the disciples, they live the life of, of sacrifice. Because they live a life of sacrifice that they could overcome. Because they could overcome, they have turned the world upside down. And then the second issue is that why we don't have any influence today. Why we don't have much influence over the world today is because the church is largely a conquered people. The church is largely a conquered people. Now, when we look at John chapter 14, verse 30, it says, Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes, and he has nothing in me. This is Jesus speaking. Now, when, when, when the devil, when the prince of the world, when the devil have nothing in us, 
This is when we can conquer the world. When we are conquered by the things of the world, when we are conquered by the prince of, 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 the, of the world, we cannot live a life that is overcoming. And so, friends, this is very, very important for us. This is why the message I think the Lord is asking us to speak to us so that we, pe we become people who overcome. What kind of life do we live? What kind of challenges are we facing today? Whatever it is, we are told to overcome. We are told to overcome so that we can influence the world. So that we determine what will happen to our life in the future. In Psalms chapter 19 verse 12 it says, So teach us to number our days, that we may get us a heart of wisdom. Friends, all of us are given 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. And this is the model that God has given us. Model is just not for business alone, but it is for our life. Now, how much of the time God gave us have we wasted on things that is valueless to eternity? Jesus never called us to make today the primary focus of our lives. He taught us to live here on earth with an eye looking towards eternity. That's why the disciples could live the way, the life they lived, because they understood this issue in their lives. Because at the end of the day, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, Everyone must die once, and after that be judged by God. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, We, however, are citizens of heaven and we eagerly wait for our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ to come from heaven while we here on earth we are to influence the world and therefore we have a responsibility friends tonight I would I would like to invite us to do something which will impact eternity so that we are really preparing ourselves for eternity. We don't have much time. We are only given a certain number of years. But as, as we have studied in the first session, I was sharing with us that this, this finite times, so this, this, this um, time that we have, this um, chronos time that we have, will come to an end. It will come to an end in Revelation chapter 20. And then we will shift to a time of eternity in Revelation chapter 21. And so we must be prepared. Are you prepared? So to prepare for this, we must be people who worship God. Because worshippers, those who worship God, worshippers will find, will know, will learn about the heart of God. We will learn to trust Him. We learn to be close with Him. We learn to feel what He feels we learn to have affection for him. Therefore, be worshippers. Now, the next thing is, while preparing for eternity, continue to grow. Don't live your life static. Don't live your life in a sense that you, you never grow from where you started. Let's continue to grow. We grow by praying. We grow by reading the words and studying the word of God. And we also have to evangelize because that is the Great Commission. And while preparing for eternity, we are given res this responsibility to evangelize the world, influence the world. And don't miss fellowship, because fellowshipping with one another will encourage us to keep our eyes focused on the things that God is telling us about eternity, encouraging one another. And lastly, keep yourself busy in the ministry. For God, wants to reward us. One thing that every Christian would anticipate, would like to hear when we meet Jesus at his judgment seat, will be the word, well done, good and faithful servant. I think all of us would like to hear this. And therefore, friends, wherever you are, who are hearing me tonight, let us together encourage one another 
that the day will come when we face Jesus at his judgment seat. This is the very word that he will speak to us. And what a joy it is when he, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, when these words come from his mouth for us to listen and for so many other people who are there at that judgment seat of Christ will also listen and then God's approval for you and me. Thank you very much and uh, let's, have, let's bow our head in prayer. Father, thank you for this message tonight. Even in the simple message that remind us, Father, we need to prepare for eternity. If for this so many years, O oh God, we have spent it on things which does not have value for eternity, forgive us. And Lord, since this is the word that you want to speak to us, Lord, give us a mind, give us a heart that really will change our perspective, perspective on life in the way that we, 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 we run our life from today onwards. Thank you, O Father, for this opportunity. Thank you, O Lord God, for your goodness. Thank you for your blessings. And bless everyone who have heard tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.